Get out of the way and let him talk. Not that I'm going to get over the stool. I can't get out anyway. <laughs> But Tony, we like to welcome you. Give it back. Thank you. Hi. My name is Tony. I'm an alcoholic. I don't know if anyone can see at the back here, but I have to. I have to be careful because uh, I've uh, snapped the tendon in my left leg. So. But, uh, so I have to keep, if I drop dead from a thrombosis, because I'm told by the doctor that I've got to keep my leg up. Being an alcoholic, I defy those orders, so. <laughs> so I try and stand as much as I can, and, uh, well, my leg's gone to sleep now. Like my head used to go to sleep many years ago. But anyway, I'll try and settle in here and see if I, are you okay there, Grant? Oh, yes, sir. Okay, well, I'll try and do the best I can. As I said, my name, I'm an alcoholic. And a day at a time, I've been uh, sober just over 22 years. Uh, I don't say that to impress you. I certainly impresses me that I stay <laughs> Because I couldn't stay sober for more than 22 minutes. And uh, that's a lie. I mean, I could actually stay dry for six weeks. That was the limit for me when I used to try and stay dry on my own. And uh, I'll better put that there. Anyway, um, where shall I start? I, I guess at the beginning. Well, no, I'll start at the end, in fact. Uh, talking about alcoholism and alcoholic personality. The thing that saved my life when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous was, it was on December 29th, 1975. I'll try and speak slowly because I've got a funny accent. <laughs> I, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous December the 29th, 1975, two days before my natal birthday, uh, in the Pacific Palisades group, in Los Angeles. And the speaker that night, there were two speakers, a man called Don, who was a doctor, and the other one was a man called Chuck C., Chuck Chamberlain. And uh, when Chuck got up to speak that night, I realized I'd come home. Um, it wasn't so much that, you know, Chuck C. was a, an alcoholic like all the rest of us, but he was a great speaker. He had a great aura about him of peace. And he described the alcoholic personality. He said that, you know, alcoholics are driven people. We are tough people. We are hard people. Uh, there is nothing. We are unstoppable people. We have great will willpower. And he said for years in his life, he tried to beat this problem with willpower. And my years really picked up that night because that's what I'd given it. I'd given it my best shot. I tried to beat this with willpower. And I failed miserably all the time. As you know, that's a regular story in these groups. I, I don't know any of you here. I know only met a few of you people. But I know that we're all the same, basically. Uh, we all have different personalities. We're all different kinds of alcoholic, but basically we're all alcoholic, drug addict, whatever. Um, uh, had I the money or the time when I started drinking I, and drugs were fashionable in those days, which they weren't, I'd have hit those as well. I drank anything I couldn't chew. <laughs> and I did everything at the double and nothing was enough for me. Uh, my thing in life was, is that all there is, like the Peggy Lee song, is that all there is? Everything was constantly disappointing me. And when I got into AA that first night, it was one of those amazing moments. Um, I thank God that I wasn't an intellectual, I wasn't clever, I wasn't very intelligent. I had an average brain, that was about it. But I'd uh, been very successful in my career, uh, through sheer willpower, I guess, and... Um, when I heard Chuck talking that night, and the other guy, Don, they talked about the self-will run riot, uh, and the power of denial of the alcoholic. And I can say tonight, standing here 22 years later, a manifestation of my own alcoholism, which is quite recently. I'm an actor, and uh, I'm making a, a movie here. I have a friend here, Alex, who's a stunt double for me. I, uh, also an alcoholic, <laughs> the Australian kind, <laughs> and we were doing a stunt I, over there, and um, Isn't the stunt double, he should pull the tendon in his <laughs> <laughs> Well, it seemed a pretty trick, but anyway, well, I, did, I had to do this thing, and I snapped the Achilles tendon, and I got up in typical alcoholic fashion, 22 years later, said, I'm okay. <laughs> I just, it's only, you know, uh, it's only a machine gun bullet wound, you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> I went back to work and I struggled through the rest of the day. Next day I was limping around and uh, with this broken tendon and everything was fine. I said, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. 
Go on. A whole week passed, and my leg started to swell up, and the ankle was bruised, and I thought, well, and the nurse on the set, she said, well, I think maybe you ought to go and see the doctor in case you have a clot in there, you know, a thrombosis, and a clot can, and a clot can kind of kill you, you know. If a clot breaks away, you can, that can be it, curtains. So I went to the doctor, and he examined it, he told me to get up on the table, he passed around on the calf, he said, he said, uh, you've snapped the tendon. I said, have I got a thrombosis? And he said, no, but you've snapped the Achilles tendon. I saw, okay, so? What's that like? He said, well, that's very serious. Oh, is it? Yeah. I said, well, what happens? If you don't have it operated in within the next two weeks, you're going to be crippled for the rest of your life. So I took a moment. I thought, well, I've had a good life. And I've got another leg. I've had a good career. I play Long John Silver now. So I considered this and I said to him, I said, yeah, fine, I don't need the operation, I'm just going to go on. I said, you mean I'll limp permanently? He said, yeah. All right. He looked at me and he said, yeah, <laughs> you can be lame. Your out of foot will atrophy. I said, no, it's no big deal. <laughs> and I was hobbling back to the car and this nurse was with me and she said, you know, you really ought to take what he said seriously because you know it's your leg, it's your health, it's more important than doing this movie. And I said, yeah, I know, but I want to go on, you know. And I phoned the producers up that night. I said, no operation. I'm just going to go on. I'll just have a limp permanently. That's all. <laughs> and I, I was amazed that they didn't react in a kind of wonderful way. You know, I think, God, great. Here, they said, uh-huh. <laughs> and three days later, they punched on me. They said, you can have the operation. And it didn't occur to me. And I phoned my sponsor up in California. And I told him the story. He said, that's typical alcoholic. And it reminds me of the denial that's in our system. That was a form of denial. Because I think we're tough resilient people. I mean, how any of us are here tonight, I don't know. I don't know how I'm alive because I should have been dead years ago. And if I wasn't dead, I would, should have been in jail years ago. Uh, life isn't fair. If it was fair, I would be dead. But I used to drive a car blacked out and still deny it. You know, I used to go down to Central Hospital in uh, Los Angeles, you know, carrying the message down. And I'd see old guys in wheelchairs shaking, falling apart with wine sores all over them. And I, and I said, what are you doing here? I said, it's an AA meeting. Do you want to come into an AA meeting? No, I'm just suffering from nerves. They say. <laughs> and that's denial, you know, looking down in the gutter, face down in the gutter and saying, you're not dying. That's what it's... And this, in a way, was a manifestation of that. In a kind of funny way. I mean, I'm glad I, they persuaded me to have the operation. But the point of that boring story was just to tell you that that is really alcoholic behavior. And I, I got it done, and it's still a pain in the butt because I'm now immobilized. And for now, I'd like to be immobilized this nightmare. <laughs> so I can't get around much, but uh, I'm stuck with this for three months, and I'm going back to work on Monday to do some sitting down work. And then we postpone the movie and we go back to Los Angeles. But anyway, the point of all this was, I, I just want to say that in that euphoria at that time, that few weeks ago, the wonderful thing about being sober is that even the possibility of being lame was exciting, because <laughs> everything is exciting. <laughs> I mean, I may be boring, but I've never been bored in 22 years. And uh, I told my sponsor this joke on the phone. He says, it's like the alcoholic on the raft. You know, the uh, alcoholic who's dying, he's on the raft. He's, his ship has gone down. He's the only survivor. And he's bobbing around in the ocean, you know. The sun is blazing down on him. He's covered in sores and he's dying. He's only got some water left for maybe another two hours. And he's, he's dying. He's had it. In the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And this big ocean liner spots him and it starts circling around. And it gets closer and closer. And the captain says, hold on, we're coming to get you. And the alcoholic says, which way are you going? <laughs> and I guess that's it. That's what we are. <laughs> but I think that's why we're such great people, because we are crazy. And I remember that night when I heard Chuck C. and uh, the, the other guy talking, and I thought, I am insane. And I've been insane for many years. And I'm allowed out. And it's okay to be here. And uh, that night I heard Chuck say, he said, we're here because we're not all there. He said, that's fine. And that's the great thing because we are alive and we are enriched souls, I believe. I don't know if we're special people. I don't think we're special. I think we're cursed people. And we're truly blessed if we can get a handle on this thing called alcoholism a day at a time. Uh, I'm, I carry around in my body and in my personality a seemingly hopeless disease, which is terminal and progressive and will kill me. And yet, for some reason, 22 years later, I'm sitting in a, a meeting house in Orlando, Florida. Uh, I, and I take it that my life is none of my business. Because I came to this country in 1974. I 
became an actor back in the 60s, I think it was, and a uh, full-blown alcoholic. And I came here in 74 to New York, and I was looking, I came to America. My intention was to make a lot of money and, you know, make the pot of gold. And the last place I expected to end up was Alcoholics Anonymous. The last place Alcoholics ever want to come to is Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and yet, this is where I ended up. Much against my will. Much against my will. And I can't explain why that happened to me. Except I think there was one streak of decency left in me and I'd done everything to get into a lot of trouble. I've been through two marriages. On my, I'm still with my second wife. And, uh, and why she lived with me all those years, I wouldn't have given me more than four minutes of my time if I'd been her. But, like we do, attract some pretty remarkable people, I think. I don't know why they put up with us, but my wife put up with me. Through the drinking years and through sobriety, I don't know which was harder for her. <laughs> and she's one of those uh, weird moderates, you know? Terminally moderate. I'm sure in Orlando with me, and um, she has one glass of wine every night. I don't know why she bothers, because it's on the table for about a whole hour. <laughs> she usually ends up pouring half of it down the drain. She smokes two cigarettes and doesn't bother to inhale. <laughs> and, and I ask her sometimes, I said, why do you bother to drink? You don't even finish it. Sometimes, you know, she's walking around the house something, you know, back in England or wherever we are, and she'll suddenly say, didn't I leave a drink somewhere? I said, it's on the kitchen table. I always know where it is. <laughs> and she said, how do you know? I said, I always know where it is. <laughs> I said, how can you even have it out of your hand? She said, well, I don't need it that much of it. I said, what does it do for you if you have one drink? She said, well, it's nice. It takes the edge off. I said, what edge? <laughs> but she's normal. She's not an alcoholic. She says things like, uh, weird things like, leave it. Let it go. Forget it. I have to go on my knees every morning to ask God to help me to forget it. Because I've got a long list of resentments in my mind that go back years and years. Even before I was born, I can resent anything. <laughs> but those normal people tend to be whatever normal means. I'm like my wife, I guess. Uh, tend to be easygoing, have an equanimity in their nature, and have a lot of common sense. And I respect them very much, and um, I have a lot of friends who are not alcoholics. They still puzzle me. I mean, I go over with some friends in London, and uh, between four of us, they, uh, we sit there at the table, or maybe some, six sometimes. I don't go out that often, but when we do. And I, I watch them. They have a bottle of wine between five of them. <laughs> And it's still half empty or half full <laughs> when we get to leave. And uh, that's the weird thing. I remember when I first got sober, and uh, it was my first year, and I was traveling from New York to Los Angeles. And there was some kind of, I don't know, public holiday. It wasn't Thanksgiving, but it was something like that, maybe for the 4th of July, I can't remember. And this stewardess in the plane was going around with um, champagne, you know? Champagne for... I can't even, I don't even, it may have been Thanksgiving. And she came to me, she said, do you want some champagne? I said, no, not for me, thanks. She said, well, come on, it's, I, you know, it's a special ace. No, 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 no. She said, not, I said, no, no, no. She said, why not? I said, I've got a report to work next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> she looked at me, she said, I don't understand. I said, no, no, do I. I don't understand. See, nothing ever satisfied me. Nothing ever satisfied me. In the ocean of booze. Nothing would ever satisfy me. Work, success, never fills the cup. I'm always wanting more. But as I'm getting older, I'm <coughs> wanting less now because I've done it all. I've had some fun. And as I said, I've never been bored in my life in these last 22 years. I never get bored. And um, I've learned a lot, I think, through the years of being sober. I hope I've been learning and will go on learning. I don't come to any great conclusions because ever, everything is pretty open-ended. I, uh, I came in to Alcoholics Anonymous as an agnostic. The most amazing thing happened. I came to New York, first of all, in 1974, and um, uh, to do a play. And I met this woman. It was in October 1974. And she was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was drunk as a skunk and sick to death and insane. And uh, she didn't say a thing. She did the typical AA thing. She left me alone. She just smiled a lot at me, never mentioned it. And we started rehearsing and we started working on this play and we were in this big successful show for eight or nine months, I think. And she, Mary, she's dead now. She died sober, but she never said a thing to me. She smiled at all my stupid jokes. Sometimes she'd come over to the bar with me and have a coffee. And there's one of those sort of restaurant bars. And I was really puzzled by her. And somebody told me, they said, you know Mary's an alcoholic. 
Now, I know that she'd gone and said to somebody, you know, tell Tony I'm an alcoholic and I'm an AA. I yeah. think that. <laughs> so they passed it on that way. <laughs> they said, you, you, you know Mary's an alcoholic. I said, oh, really? God, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't see her drinking. They said, no, she doesn't drink. She's an AA. What's that? An alcoholic? Oh, I said, that lot. Yeah, that's religious. Yeah, well, she's sober anyway. I said, that's why she smokes so much. Is that why she looks... <laughs> I couldn't figure that. And I never dreamed of asking her. And then on uh, my last uh, few weeks in New York, I remember I was in a party. And um, I, was, I tried to stay s dry for about six weeks. And I was in this party and uh, I was drinking. And I was in bad shape. And I asked her for help. And she took me out next day. We went out and had a meal. And she tried to... She gave me some information about this weird program called Alcoholics Anonymous and she said some pretty insulting things to me that a child could understand. She said, you know, if you don't take the first drink, you won't get drunk. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Who's talking to me like this Mickey Mouse language? You know? <laughs> she said, it's like taking an elevator from the top floor and you can get off at any floor you want or you can go right down to the basement and into hell. Or she's like taking a subway from Park Avenue right down to the Bowery. She said, you can get off any time you want to. I thought, why is she talking to me in this fairy tale language? So she said, would you like to come to a meeting? And I said, no. Having asked for help, I typical alcohol turned her down. But I stayed dry on my own for five weeks with a little help of a little bit of glass, which I didn't like much. That wasn't my scene. But I stayed sober for some years, stayed dry. And I think at that time something had happened, something had shifted chemically in my body, a mind, whatever. I flew out to California in July of 75 and I naturally I first I took that first drink and I hit the booze pretty bad. Then I dried out another few days, maybe a couple of weeks, then I hit it again and it was tequila was the stuff I used to love, you know, tequila. And it did wonderful things for my brain, tequila. <laughs> Being an agnostic or an atheist, it gave me visions of God and angels. You know. This is hallucinogenic, the, the amount I was drinking. And I think by that time my tolerance had become pretty low. My threshold had become low and I didn't need to drink that much and I would start to hallucinate and get these strange religious visions. They were really weird. But what it did, it softened me up for this program because in December 1975, I, my wife left to go back to London. Uh, she left, she wanted to go back to let me die if that's what I chose to do or give me space to die. She knew she couldn't handle me anymore and uh, I remember saying to her, I was driving her to the airport, I said, I think I'm an alcoholic. She said, oh yeah. <laughs> I said, maybe I'll join A, sure. And she had changed completely. She gave me the cold shoulder. And I saw her off the... I said, say hello to your family and have a good flight. She said, yeah. And I realized in that moment as she turned her back on me that I had lost the one person I'd ever loved. She was walking away from me. And I hated her for it. But I knew what she meant. She couldn't take any more. Got in the car and I drove down to Arizona. I started my drive to Arizona. I was on my way to New Mexico to find those magic mushrooms that Carlos Castaneda <laughs> Not that I'd ever read Carlos Castaneda because I never had the staying power to read anything very much, but I heard about these magic mushrooms and the Yaki Indians and all that. So that's where I was headed. I wanted to get it off the planet. You know, I wanted something stronger than tequila. Anyway, I didn't get that far. I got as far as Arizona on Christmas Day and I was staying in this lousy hotel. I phoned my wife on Christmas morning in London. I said, Happy Christmas. She said, Thank you. <laughs> Where are you? I said, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh-huh. No surprise at all. Well, have a good time. She put the phone down. And I drove back to California, and uh, I, on the 27th of December, 1975, I sat in my apartment, and I knew it was over. And I felt that loneliness that only alcoholics feel, I think. Well, I, I don't think we call it the market on loneliness, but I think it's a special loneliness that alcoholics feel because we're going insane. And next thing I remember somebody phoned me and I ended up in a party. And I was in this party sitting under a piano, which is not sort of normal behavior of social <laughs> Having a fight with another actor. <laughs> and it was in Beverly Hills and anyway this woman picked me up and she said, come on, you're going home. And I stood outside up with this friend of mine and I said, uh, I've lost my car. Somebody's stolen my car. I said, no, they didn't steal it. He said, you left it in the middle of Worship Boulevard <laughs> with the engine running and the radio on. Don't you remember? I said, no. He said, somebody saw you, got in the car, drove you here, and you don't remember? I said, no. 
I said, all I know is that I'm an alcoholic and I need help. And I looked at the, those, those, I think they were pepper trees, and the sky, and I thought, somebody up there really likes me because I should be dead by now. I used to do all those crazy things, drive my car in blackouts, never remembering next day where I'd been, whether I'd killed anyone. I'd always check the radiator to see if I'd any blood or anything or damage. I don't know why they didn't catch me. The police never picked me up. And I can't remember driving, you know, over the canyons into the valley and at night. And um, this friend stayed with me. I went to his house and I said, I'm an alcoholic. I sort of sobered up. It's like a pilot life went on. And uh, I stayed Sunday back at my apartment. Didn't think of phoning AA. I thought I'd give myself 24 hours to think about this very seriously, which is very dangerous to think <laughs> for an alcoholic, especially on my own. So on the Monday, I got up and uh, I thought, well, maybe I'm making a big thing of this. And a little voice inside prompted me, said, pick up the phone and phone alcoholic songs. I phoned them up and a woman answered the phone. And her name was Dorothy. She was an elderly woman. And I said, my name is Tony. I'm an alcoholic. I'm, I think I'm an alcoholic. I said, I'm beaten. I don't think I can drink anymore. She said, that's good. I said, I feel terrible. She said, that's good. <laughs> I said, I'm kind of at my wit's end. She said, that's really good. <laughs> and she said, do you want me to send somebody over to see you? This was 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, no. I didn't want anyone in the white raincoat and the Bible and a uh, bottle of scotch coming over to see me, smiling goodness all over me. I was very suspicious of this organization. I resented elderly ladies with teacups and cookies saying, Hi, honey. <laughs> I didn't want anything to do with that charity. I hated Christianity, church, everything about God and holiness and goodness. I thought I hated. But deep down, I didn't. Of course, I wanted it. I wanted to be normal. This monkey was on my back and I couldn't get rid of it. People had told me, friends said, You know, Tony, you're so successful. You're so talented. Why do you do this to yourself? Said, do what? Can't you just cut down the drinking? And I'd look at them, that disgusted look. Are they insane? Cut down? Why? Why cut down anything? Why, why take half measures at anything? So I went into the central office in West Los Angeles. And um, uh, I met this lady, Dorothy. And uh, she's a woman in her 70s, I think. And I walked into this pine wood office and the smell of coffee. Beautiful, sunny California morning, Monday morning. And uh, I said, my name is Tony, I phoned you. She said, yeah. She looked like one of those ladies out of Norman Rockwell, you know. She said, sit down. I sat down and she talked to me for a little while. And she said, what do you do? I said, I'm an actor. She said, oh, my husband was in your business. She said, he was a sound engineer in the movie business, motion picture business. She said he nearly died of alcoholism, and she said, uh, I came in to volunteer as a, to answer phones. She wasn't an alcoholic herself. She's one of those, you know, very Christian women. So she talked to me about the nature of alcoholism, and I said, well, I've stopped many times, but I can't stay stopped. She said, well, that is alcoholism, honey. I said, I can stop, but I can't stay stopped. She said, that is alcoholism. And she said, it'll kill you. She said, you're a nice-looking young guy. She said, what? You don't want to kill yourself, do you? I said, no. She married, I said, yeah, gave her my history. And I got up to go, and I said, what do I do? She said, well, I'll give me your phone number, and I'll get somebody to come over and see you tonight and take you to a meeting. And they said, meeting? Immediately, my defenses went up. I said, is it religious? She said, no. Just try it and see. And as I got up to go, she obviously saw that my, I was in a great dilemma. I was in an agonizing dilemma. But I knew it was over. I knew the show was over. I know that I'd been waiting for years for life to start. I was rehearsing for the big event all my life. And I was on the sense, on the verge of discovering that this was the big event in my life. And she said to me very gently, she said, why don't you come home and rest? And I got all choked up and emotional. I thought it was swallows come home to Cabestrano. <laughs> she said, just come home and rest. And then she did that hokey thing. And her voice, she said, why don't you just trust in God? And everything... I knew she was going to zap me with that word, <laughs> the G-O-D word, and it was like a door opened and a light went on and I thought everything I've tried with my keen alcoholic brain has failed. 
all my first class thinking, all my reading of power of positive thinking and self-help books, all that stuff I'd done, a valiant effort to change myself had, hadn't actually got me out of the nightmare that I was in. Some of it had helped me to get towards it, however. And lo and behold, as she said that, I thought, well, why not? I got down on the street and the most remarkable thing ever happened to me in my life, and it was one of those moments, and I don't say it to claim that I was special because I wasn't, but maybe it's what I needed. It was the thing that happened to Bill Wilson, but it's what I needed, I guess, because I thought I was too smart or too clever or too successful or too, I don't know, what I was supposed to thought I was. I really never had much of an opinion myself anyway. I never liked myself. I always thought I was stupid. But at that moment, something happened. I got down on the street, and it was the beautiful sunny morning, and a big voice deep inside me said, it's all over, and now you can start living. And it's all been for a purpose, so don't forget one moment of it. Now go about your life. And it was that clear, and the craving to drink left me that moment, 27th, 29th of December, 1975, probably about 11, 10.45 in the morning. So much so that I got into the car, and I knew, what was, I knew what it was. It's something I've been looking for all my life. Ever since I'd been a little kid, I came home from school at the age of four, one afternoon, and I told my father that they... He said, what do they teach you today, sonny? And my father, God rest his soul, was an alcoholic. I think he was. He died a bitter man, an unhappy man, restless. And when he drank, he did those things that we do. But he only drank in later years. When he said, what did they teach you? I, told, they, I, I said, they taught me the Lord's Prayer and 23rd Psalm. He said, they're rubbish. Don't believe in God and all that rubbish. There's nothing there. It's all rubbish. Get out in the world. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Don't trust anyone. Do them before they can do you. That was his philosophy. He didn't really practice that because he was a softy like all of us, you know. <laughs> but he tried to be tough. He was like Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman. Never felt he got his life right, you know. And he died sadly in 1981, frightened and alone. And that moment, for that time from the age of four right up until that night, I used to sit in cathedrals, in uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York in my drunken years, looking at people praying, saying, what the hell are they on about? What is all this? Why are they on their knees? Are these intelligent people or are they just dummies? And sure enough, that old friend of mine from four years of age turned on me and said, hi, I've been waiting for you. And that's what it was. That voice was like an old power. So much so that I, I, I was going up Ohio Avenue and I stopped off and I went into this Catholic church. And I saw a priest crossing from church into his office. So I said, could I talk to you a moment? He said, yeah, come in. I, I went and sat with him. I didn't know what possessed me, but uh, he said, can I help you? I said, yeah. I was looking pretty rough. I said, I think I've found God. He said, well, congratulations. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know what to do about it. I said, I, so I told him, I, I'm an alcoholic and I just joined AA. He said, well, that's a good organization. He said, they're great people, the Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, and uh, he said, if that's what you're looking for, if you're an alcoholic, you're in the best place. I said, is it religious? He said, well, if you found God, you shouldn't have any problem with that. <laughs> See, he's zappy, copy, whichever you could. I, I was hard. I couldn't, I couldn't get out of this fix I was in. So I went back to the apartment, and uh, Dorothy, the woman from central office, phoned me up. She said, any, have you got any alcohol? I said, yeah, I've got some beer. I'm pouring it away now. She said, well, just pour it down the sink. Do you want me to hold on to the phone? I said, no. So I pour it away. She said, well, somebody will phone you. And that night, a man called George phoned me, and... And he was everything I expected. You know, he phoned me. He did one of those mean things that alcoholics and anonymous people do. He phoned me, Sam, my name's George. I'm an alcoholic. Is that Tony? I see him. Have you had a drink today? No. Because we're devious sons of bitches, all of us. <laughs> he said, what's your address? So I give him the address. And he said, I'll see you at 6.30. He slammed the phone down. So I couldn't get back to him. I could. So I thought, I'll go and hide. <laughs> 6.30 enough. Sure, the bell rang and I went down the stairs dreading it. But I was kind of curious as well, and there was George, silver hair, crooked smile, straight teeth, and his girlfriend Lila. She was chewing gum, and we got into the car, and George smelled of aftershave lotion, and he gave me a handshake which nearly broke my hand. He said, hi, my name's George, I'm an alcoholic. I'm in with the nuts now, I'm really in with the weirdos, born again Christians, and with all due respect, I don't want anything to do with this, it's the Salvation Army, as much respect, I don't want anything to do with charity and tambourines and singing hymns, I don't want anything to do with it. So we put into this car park in the Pacific Palisades, ironically enough, I bought a house there recently, just up the street from there, so life has a strange way of completing the circles. And as I got out of the car, I saw this actor, this old guy, walking down from his car with his wife, with a crowd of other people, so I said to him, I said, what's he doing here? I said, I just worked with him, he said, he's an alcoholic. I said, I just worked with him last 
the van base. Huh? He's an alcoholic. I walked in the meeting and this old fellow said, Hi, Tony, how are you doing? <laughs> I've been waiting for you. <laughs> I said, did you know? He said, oh, Tony. He said, we always know. He said, sit down. And then a guy called Bob came over and I sat between these two men. And that night a man called Don got up and spoke. The first, he was the first speaker. It was an hour and a half long, the meeting. And... Um, <laughs> I've got to go for another 20 minutes. Well, uh, anyway, so uh, Don got up and he was a surgeon from Palace Verdes. And he said, he said, my name's Don, I'm an alcoholic. And he looked like one. He looked like, an, he looked like he'd been hit by a truck. A long black hair, beaten up face. And he had a voice like, that. he's my name's Don, I'm an alcoholic. And he said, describe himself as a surgeon. I mean, how can I be a surgeon? Yes, I'm a surgeon, you know. And he said, my moment of awakening was when I was standing over a patient who was open. <laughs> I said, I was about to operate, and the nurse said, Doctor, you've just operated. So I upgraded. <laughs> and everyone in the room started laughing. I thought they were all crazy. <laughs> and he was laughing, everyone was laughing. I thought, God. Oh. I thought these people are really onto something. Yeah, they were all laughing. And then we had a coffee break, and uh, then the second speaker got up. He said, My name's Shaq, I'm not garlic. He said, By the grace of God, he said, I have 30 years this sober this January. And I thought, well, he must be suffering from da brain damage. How can anyone get that? And he talked about the nature of this disease, and he said, you know, he spent his whole life trying to organize everyone else. They used to call him the drunken preacher in Beverly Hills. <laughs> he knew all about God and the Bible, and he used to stand in the middle of Wilshire Boulevard, preaching the gospel, put in and out of jail. Crazy man. And he finally got sober in 1946. And he said that this disease is a progressive, cunning, baffling, powerful, and it's terminal and it kills you and he said it's all about surrender he said the moment you surrender he said and give up fighting the fighting everything and everyone he said you get you know he said you'll find the good life and he said the moment he start, he stopped looking for the million dollars he made ten million the moment he stopped trying to travel around the world he traveled around many many times the moment he stopped trying to run his family his family became a family without his help and I thought this really makes sense I thought I was listening to Buddha and the meeting ended and I was introduced to Chuck and he said uh, so George introduced me he said this is Tony it's his first meeting and Chuck put his hands on my shoulders he said you just keep coming back he said because we're the luckiest people in the world he said we get better than better we alcoholics are remarkable people he said if you're in this organization and in this outfit stay in he said I highly recommend it and he said if you do it he said you'll find the good life and I'm here to say that I have found the good life. I wouldn't say that it's Pollyanna or every day, you know, it's not a bed of roses. Life is tough. Life is unfair. If it was fair, I should be dead years ago. There is no justice. If there was justice, I should have been dead years ago. I should have been in jail, in, in jail, in the booby hatch. Or I should have been in the insane asylum. But for some reason, beyond any of my knowledge, any understanding, I came to California in 1975 and for... God knows what reason, ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I take it that my life is none of my business. The moment I make it my business, I'm in big trouble. Because I'm back in the squirrel cage. Toy, and every day I want to take it back. Every day I want to take it back. But that's okay, that's being human. You know, as Guy said, you know, you can't get rid of the human ego totally. We need some of that. It's the burr under the saddle that keeps us moving. We have to keep moving. We have to take actions, we have to make decisions, and they many times make wrong decisions. But at least we give it our best shot. And that's what Chuck used to say, give it your best shot. Just give it the best you got. And I got over the years, I've met the most stunning people, you know, and I've been all over the place, all over the world. And I remember going to Australia, and in Melbourne, and going to a meeting, and, you know, meeting a bunch of Australians in a room. And actually, you've made a lot of Australians in Australia. <laughs> I'm my friend here. And, or oh, in New York, you're meeting a lot of New Yorkers in a meeting. I don't know who they are. I go in, but within minutes I know what they are. Because we all have the X factor. Alcoholic. Drunk. Addict. And I'd always wanted, when I was a young actor, I always wanted to be an alcoholic. I thought it was so romantic, you know. <laughs> I still have the word dipsomaniac. Alcoholic. I used to think it's such a gritty word to be an alcoholic. Little knowing that I was one. <laughs> And uh, I'd like to say for the newcomer, uh, the guy who's just been here six days, that, or anyone new, or anyone old, that it's not the amount we drink, it wasn't the amount I drank, it was what it did to me. It was the effect it had on me. 
When I look at my wife, who is as peculiar to me as she, I must be to her, her, certainly her drinking habits are, I look at someone, and millions of people like her, who can do everything in sort of moderation. She has her little hang-ups, I guess, little obsessions. Cleaning. <laughs> Order. That's right. Doesn't have to be put in jail for it. She passes me about, she tells me what to wear, and I say, okay, fine. But that's her right, that's her preference, and that's wonderful. And I love her for it. But looking at her, I think sometimes I said, I ask her sometimes, I said, how is it you can handle your life so well? She said, well, what's the problem? <laughs> you know, she's getting older, me, I'm getting older, so if she wants to go on a diet, she'll just cut out certain foods. Me, I have to struggle and beat my brains out. <laughs> she said, well, just cut down. I said, what do you mean, just cut down? <laughs> Try chewing your food slower. I said, I can't, why? <laughs> he tell you, I'm the fastest Caesar in the world. I do my own stunts now, I don't know. <laughs> but that recent injury was a case in point of being an alcoholic. I think the greatest thing, and I feel inspired to say this, how much longer do I go on? So, well, I'll try and wrap it up soon. Time for a coffee, actually. I, I think the greatest thing for us, and for me, is I'd always looked for the beautiful people. I'd always wanted the beautiful life, and I found it in the Alcoholics Anonymous, in all shapes and sizes. Most, met the most remarkable people. I was talking to one this morning, as a 36-year-old con man, and he's still a con man. He was a drunk con man, now he's a sober con man. <laughs> and I can see every move he makes. He's, hi, Tony, how you doing, huh? <laughs> and I understand him. He's, you know, he's a sober horse thief. I love him for it. Because he can't stop doing what he does. And, you know, I know a couple of alcoholics who are gamblers. Can't stop gambling. But they're sober. And I've met, you know, aging hippies, like I feel like an aging hippie with his beard. <laughs> and I, I have the most romantic life. I live a wonderful life. And every day I have to remember, because every day I'll grumble and I'll complain about this, that, and the other. My leg is going to sleep. It's okay. And um, I'll complain about everything. But I have to remember all the time. And I've got a list of resentments in my head that'll take me back an elephantine memory for insults and sideswipes. But I have to remember that I, those can kill me. I heard a story, a guy called Clancy, you've probably heard his tapes, so an extraordinary man. I was in a meeting uh, in the Pacific Palisades last year. And Clancy run, runs the mission in downtown Los Angeles for all the down and outs of the alcoholics on the streets. And uh, their average is maybe 10% survivor. Most of them die. Uh, Clancy does this amazing job with them. And he was an alcoholic himself, he was an alcoholic himself, and he was sober, tried 19 years trying to get sober. And an amazing guy. And he and Chuck were very close friends. But I remember him saying, we had a meeting one morning, uh, an early morning meeting, Pacific Palisades, last year, something I believe. And he said, my name's Clancy and I'm an alcoholic. And he said, this room, he said, I used to come to this meeting, it was uh, held on a Saturday morning here, years ago. He said, my sponsor started this. He said, my sponsor saved my life, but my sponsor died drunk. He said, because? They changed the seating arrangement <laughs> without telling him. And although that was kind of funny, it was very sad. He said, because that's what gets us drunk. It's the snapping shoelace. It's the appointment that's not kept. The little tiny things. We can handle earthquakes. We can handle twisters. We can handle anything. But snapping shoelace or somebody looking at us from the, the passing bus can get us drunk. And all the ingredients of all the peculiarities that we are, all the weird stuff that was, makes us all, uh, makes all of us up, and certainly in my case I know the weird, strange things that go on in my mind, that I feel like a rich person because I've made friends with people who are, uh, you know, I, I mean, you know what I mean, I'm the richest people I mean in the world, I don't mean financially rich, just amazing people, power-packed people ex-cons, people who were in jails, and uh, I knew a guy in Los Angeles who was, uh, had a, his last drunk was a shootout with the police, he and his wife, and they ended up in, in a big jail and for 10 years, and he came out and uh, reformed, sober alcoholic, and he's about 30 years sober now, his name is Woody, an amazing guy, and I've had the privilege of meeting people like that, and some of the old times, what I love about this meeting, I've only been here three times, it reminds me of the early days in Los Angeles, when people used to smoke. <laughs> I was in a meeting with Alex a couple of weeks ago, uh, at a meeting up at Kissimmee, I think, and uh, people were smoking. And I thought it was like the good old days. I don't smoke myself, and, you know, I, I don't like it when it's too smoky. But it kind of it took me back 22 years ago, and I used to go to those meetings, some of those old-timers were there, sitting around the clubhouses playing cards. 
And these are the guys who saved my life. I remember going into the central office in my first week after being sober for one, seven days. and I was feeling nervous one morning and I was sitting in the coffee shop. My wife hadn't come back from England and, and I was very nervous and I, I was convinced I wouldn't be able to f figure this program out. I, I'd failed at everything in my life and I thought, that I'll fail at this. I know, I'm bound to screw this one up. So I walked down the street and went back into that central office that I told you about. And there's a man there called Dan. He was a big guy. He had tattoos all over him. And he was the last person on earth I wanted to see. And I uh, said, yeah, what can I do with you? I said, my name's Tony. He said, my name's Dan. I'm an alcoholic. And he looked at me and he had big head, big shoulders. He looked like a killer. I think he was a killer. <laughs> he said, how are you doing? I said, got five days up. And he gave me a big... I said, I'm scared. He said, you're scared? I'm scared. He said, I'm always scared. I said, you? Yeah. He said, I'm an alcoholic. He said, everyone's scared. He said, I'm scared. So what? Come have a coffee. And magical things like that. And he put me at my ease. And I realized that I didn't have to be John Wayne. You know, John Wayne had scripts, you know. <laughs> you know, so, you know, he didn't have to be Humphrey Bogart, sort of looking cool or whatever. But that's what I tried all my life, to be like the, somebody else. You know, and uh, I've learned some lessons in this life that, a few lessons anyway, I hope. You know, I have a cat who's quite in, content being a cat. It doesn't want to be a dog. You know, but me, I always want to be somewhere else. Look at a hummingbird. It doesn't, doesn't want to be a crow. It's quite happy being a hummingbird. But we all always want to be somewhere else. And I really have to close now. Um, I remember my first uh, two years of sobriety, my wife and I drove down to into Arizona. We bought a new car and uh, we took off. And I'd been, this is an alcoholic. And we got to the lip of the Grand Canyon. And we were, got up early sunrise to go and see the down into the Grand Canyon. And I looked down and I said, is that it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was deeper than that. It's not enough. Is that all there is? <laughs> I guess that's why we drank and used drugs because life is constantly disappointing us. We have such a lust for life and life is constantly letting us down so we commit suicide slowly on the installment plan I guess that's what the dynamic is we slowly commit suicide because we can't get enough of the elixir of life alcohol has been with us for thousands of years it's used in religious ceremonies we just about a little bit too much of God I guess but as they said we look for God in the bottle I was looking for God in the bottle and I found some kind of peace of mind momentarily and then it would turn round and zapped me and I had the tiger by the tail for all those years and all I can say is um, and I will run out now just going back to that little injury business I had a few weeks ago when I decided that I didn't need an operation <laughs> only a couple of bullet wounds so I got another leg chop it chop this one off I didn't but the funny thing was I was kind of excited by a future like that I thought this would be fun this would be interesting <laughs> this would be really interesting you know to have a limp <laughs> crazy but it's interesting. At least we're alive. And uh, I guess that's it. I love being here tonight and I, I'm just sorry I'm so immobile and I can't move around much. But in my short stay here in Orlando, it's been a pleasure meeting you all and meeting some of you and uh, meeting you all tonight. I hope I get to say hello to you all. And to the newcomer and anyone having problems with alcoholism at the moment or recovery, just keep coming back. As I was told, just keep coming back. There was a guy called Milton, and he'd been so many years, and he said, how are you doing? And I'd say, well, you know, he said, just keep coming back. <laughs> yeah, but just keep coming back. <laughs> yeah, but you just keep coming back. <laughs> and he tapped me on the head, he said, that's a very sick machine you've got up there. <laughs> what do you mean? He said, that's a sick piece of machine you've got up there. He said, just keep coming to me. That's. He said, don't ask questions, leave all your thinking outside, because that's the thing that'll kill you. Said, that'll kill you, he said. Get your backside into the meeting, park it on the seat, shut up and listen. You know, take the cotton out of your ears. And, uh, and uh, he told me, he said in the early days when he got sober, if he even dared to open his mouth when he was a newcomer, people would say, did you open, were you going to say something or you were going to put a donut in there? <laughs> You've got nothing to say. You're a newcomer. He said, in those days they were really tough. And I had some tough sponsors in those days. Some, some of those old guys in Los Angeles and North Hollywood were the great guys, you know, who, helped me and I hope and pray that maybe my 
humble words. I hope they've been made some sense to someone and will help uh, because you certainly helped me tonight. Thanks a lot. Yeah.